So the title of my talk is Structural Pathways of Cancer Cellular Networks. Why doesn't it? So how does a cell respond to environmental cues? To respond, signals need to be relayed from the extracellular space to the nucleus, I'm sorry, from the extracellular space through the cytoplasm to the nucleus and back. So what happens is that signaling molecules bind to the extracellular domain of membrane spanning receptor. These are at the top right hand side of the diagram, then they pass through the membrane, through the cytoplasm, and then through physical interactions between the proteins in the cell. And the proteins that relay the signal make up a signaling pathway. Along the way, each protein may modify the pathway, the signal. Pathways may integrate, as we see at the bottom left-hand side panel. They may crosstalk, as we see on the right-hand side diagram. They can branch, as we see on the right-hand side panel, and get amplified. And to figure out how signals propagate in the cell, we need at the very least the structural network of the signaling pathways and the protein and pathway dynamics. And this can be very nicely seen in the yeast protein-protein interaction network, which has over 1,500 proteins and over 2,300 interactions. Looking at this map, it is immediately obvious that a huge effort has been invested in constructing it. It is also obvious that it contains an enormous amount of information. Yet, when we look at it, we still do not understand. We do not understand how the signals propagate. We do not understand how the cell functions under physiological condition and what happens in disease. We don't understand how oncogenic mutations alter the network or alter the signal, and we do not understand how the proteins and the proteome function. A node is a protein, an edge a protein-protein interaction. Some proteins have a small number of interactions. Other proteins, the so-called hub proteins, can have a very large number of interactions, which can be in the tens and even in the hundreds. And even if these proteins are very large multi-domain ones, they still do not have physically um, sufficient surface area exposed to have distinct binding sites. So to understand how the proteome functions, to understand signaling under physiological conditions and in disease, and to understand this, uh, the signaling dynamics under varied conditions, we need to have structures and we need to be able to predict what is the preferred way for proteins to interact? So what is the preferred way for proteins to interact? An ultimate goal is to predict the preferred mode of protein associations. We know similar protein structures can associate in different ways, and different protein structures can associate in similar ways. So what is the preferred way for proteins to interact? Currently, there are two major strategies. The first is docking. A definition of the docking problem, given two or more protein structures, predict their native interactions. Docking is difficult because there are many possible favorable ways for protein to interact, proteins to interact, and in the absence of additional biochemical data, it is very difficult to distinguish between the native interaction and the other interactions. There will always be patches of hydrophobic surface areas, hydrogen bonds, salt bridges, etc. Docking becomes much more difficult if we don't even know if the proteins interact. The second way 
is knowledge-based using protein-protein interaction databases. Protein-protein interaction databases form the basis for mapping pathways and the basis for a more complete picture of the organization of the cell. And within these, a protein-protein interface data set is particularly useful. This is because the number of motifs in single-chain proteins, and as we have shown over the years in protein-protein interfaces, is limited in nature. Consequently, a protein-protein interface data set is useful for predicting protein-protein interactions, for the construction of interaction networks, and for large-scale proteom docking, particularly when combined with refinement and energy scoring, which is what we have been doing. Proteins interact through their surfaces. So here we have a trimer with three chains with two interfaces. Our definition of an interface is as consisting of residues which are in contact across the two chains. Here we see for one interface they are in purple, for the other they are in gray, and residues which are nearby the residues which are in contact. For one interface they are in cyan, for the other they are in green. The problem is that the interfaces do not consist of continuous fragments. Consequently, there is no sequential order. So an interface consists of single residues and bits and pieces of the chain which are in contact or nearby the sister chain. We can see this in the panel on the left-hand side. The boxed region is the interface. And on the right-hand side, we can see this. We see that the interface consists of residues 33 to 41, 60 to 61, 63 to 67, 153, 72 to 83, and so forth. Now, in order to construct a non-redundant data set of protein-protein interfaces, we need to compare all interfaces in our database with each other. If the, inter if the, res if the interfaces consist of contiguous references, then it's straight, uh, relatively straightforward because we know how to superimpose the two interfaces. If they don't, then in principle what we need to do is to try and match every patch of surface of one, resi of, one in of one interface with every patch of surface of another in all rotations and all translations, which in practice it's an impossibility. And here we can see this. Suppose on the left hand side we have one interface and on the right hand side we have another. Suppose each circle depicts the coordinates of a C alpha atom. As we can see in space, A corresponds to A, B to B, C to C, D to D, and E, and E to E. However, on the left hand side, the protein chain connectivity goes A, B, C, D, E. On the right hand side, it goes A, B, E, C, and D. So, so finding this spatial similarity without a sequential order is very difficult. And here I always like to take a little bit of time off to explain how the apparent difference between the fields and yet how interdisciplinarity and collaboration across the fields help. When I was faced with this up with this problem, I met Haim Wolfson, uh, uh, who since then has become a long-time collaborator at the on the campus of Tel Aviv University. Haim spent many years in the Israeli army, and he was then focusing on, or his expertise in, is in computer vision and robotics. And I asked him, Haim, what are you doing these days? And he was just telling me, he said, well, imagine Ruth, that you have a series of aerial photographs. 
and you want to, def to detect an unpredefined pattern in these aerial photographs when they recur with so-called errors. For example, consider a tank, but the tank can appear in these aerial photographs with some occlusion, for example, by other vehicles, buildings, trees, etc. But you still want to be able to detect that you have the same object recurring in the aerial photographs. When I heard this, I got very excited. I literally jumped because it was immediately apparent that the, despite the seemingly very different fields, nonetheless, the problems that we were facing are quite similar. Heim's aerial photographs correspond to our series of PDB files. His pixels in the uh, pictures or in the images are our atomic coordinates. His errors or occlusion refers to our or correlates with others, mis with ours, mismatches, insertions, and deletions, etc. He was looking for similarity of the, or detection of patterns of points in three-dimensional space, which is exactly what we need to do in order to compare our interfaces. Together, then, we started this collaboration addressing this problem and adapted his computer vision-based algorithm, which is called geometric hashing, to our problem. How does it work? Then to generate the data set of non-redundant protein-protein interfaces, we start with the PDB, which is the protein structure database. We consider all molecules, monomers, dimers, trimers. We then mark all two chain interfaces here, now shown in bold. We then extract them. We then carry out and all against all structural comparisons of these, leading to their clustering, using the geometric hashing algorithm, of course, leading to their clustering. And then we pick a representative from each of the clusters. This representative then forms our non-redundant data set of protein-protein interfaces. When we then looked at our clusters, we realized that we have three types of clusters. The first type is less interesting in the sense that it's expected. We have clusters with similar interfaces. That's not surprising. After all, we clustered by the interface structures. The global structures of the chains are similar and the functions are similar. Types two and three are much more interesting. In type two, we have clusters with similar interfaces. However, the global structures of the chains are different and the functions are different here. If you compare in the second panel in the middle, you can see that the orange on both sides looks different and the green looks different. And in type 3, we have interface clusters with only one similar side. The complementary side is somewhat different. So in type 2, we have a situation where we have similar interfaces and different functions. So type 2 is similar to monomer structures where evolution has utilized good, favorable motifs for many different functions. So of all the combinatorial possible ways for different monomer structures of the proteins, right, to associate, they still prefer to interact in similar ways to meet preferred interface architectures. And I don't have time to show you, but these in preferred interfaces, the structures of these preferred interfaces are the same ones which are preferred in single chain proteins. Examples, interface clusters with similar interfaces here, boxed, uh, you can see on both sides, you see that the, on the inside in yellow, you, we can see similarity in structures, and the, but these similar global folds of the proteins compare the pink, for example, chain on the left-hand side with the green or cyan on the right-hand side, and 
these similar functions. Another example, similar interfaces, again, box. These similar global structures of the chains, again, compare the pink with the green, either the top or the bottom, and these similar functions. And finally, the last example, similar interfaces, these similar global structures, and these similar functions. Here, for example, one at, on the bottom we can see, one is a cohesin domain from the scaffolding, pro a scaffolding protein, and the other is a red fluorescent protein. So the point is that type two with similar interfaces and different global structures allows the prediction of protein interactions across signaling pathways and the protein. So how do we go about the prediction? Suppose the circles on the top contain, each one contains a representative interface. We then take the left-hand side of the interface or one side of the interface and carry out a structural comparison with the entire surfaces of all the monomers in our PDB. Then we take the complementary side of the interface and again carry out a structural comparison with the entire surfaces of all the monomers in the PDB. Then we predict that those proteins that have a patch of surface similar to the left-hand side of the interface can interact with proteins which have a patch of surface which is similar to the right-hand side of the protein, of the interface. Similarly, we do this for the next representative, take the one side of the interface, carry out structural comparison with entire surfaces, of all the monomers in the PDB, then the right-hand side and compare with the entire surfaces, and then again predict that those proteins which have a patch of surface similar to one side can interact with those which have a patch of surface similar to the other side. And those red circles that you see are the residue hotspots which contribute the, um, significantly to the stability of the interaction. And so on and so forth, we do this for all the cluster, for all the representatives in our data set. So the prediction algorithm, we start with a representative as a template. All the monomers in the PDB are targets. Then we take one side of, of, of the interface, suppose we take the surface on A, and carry out a comprehensive structural comparison with the entire surfaces of all the monomers in the PDB that we can see there. Suppose we find that the surface on A is similar to the surface on F. Then we take the complementary side, the surface on B, and carry out a structural comparison with the entire surfaces of all the monomers in the PDB. Suppose we find that the surface on B is similar to the surface on E, on G, and on D. So then we can predict that F can bind, can interact with B, with D, with G, and with even though the global structures of B, D, G, and E can be totally different from each other. Then we filter, refine, we score, we rank, and check against experimental databases to predict the output structures. I don't know what that is. I'm just, okay. So, so coming back then to the question that we asked at the beginning of the talk, so how can the prediction of the preferred way for proteins to interact help in understanding cellular pathways? A classical representation, as we can see on the screen here, which is typical, and one can see this in many networks, in talks, in papers, uh, in books, 
is difficult to understand. What we can see is that the protein P1 here at the center in the box can interact with P4, P3, P1, and P2. However, we have no idea which of these interactions can take place at the same time and which cannot. However, if we translate this representation into a structural representation, which using the strategy that I have just described we can do, then we can see that protein P1 can interact with P2, P4, and P6 at the cannot interact with P2, P4, and P6 at the same time, since they interact through the same B11 interface. However, protein P3 can interact with P1 at the same time as P6 or P4 or P2, since they interact through distinct interfaces. So, how coming back then to, um, to try to understand this. So the binding can be at the same shared site. However, the site can be slightly different with minor or major conformational changes depending on earlier allosteric event. And that the site may decide in addition to concentration, post-translational modification, etc with which protein the, a given protein will interact at any given time. And this concept can be applied to the modeling of protein-protein interactions in pathways across the proteome. Applications to key cellular pathways that we have carried out so far include ubiquitination. The regulation of protein degradation can cause overexpression in cancer. Apoptosis. This function can deregulate cell survival versus death. The MEPK pathway, again, relates, as we know, to signaling in cancer. Interleukin-1 relates to inflammation and cancer. IL-10, inflammation and cancer. The RAS protein, which we are now working on. Over 20% of human RAS, of human cancers have oncogenic mutations in their RAS genes. The toll-like receptor, again, inflammation related to cancer, and the nuclear hormone receptor. Particularly, we have been focusing on the glucocorticoid receptor and to some extent on the mineral receptor. Here is an apoptosis pathway map and which illustrates the point that I've been trying to make about the critical importance of having structures and the way in which the proteins interact in the pathway. This apoptosis pathway map, which is redrawn following the KEG, the KEG stands for the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, and there are many such diagrams. In the, if you just look in the internet, again, in papers, books, talks, etc., there are absolutely no structures. What we can see are proteins. These are in the in the as nodes, or we see these as ellipsoids here, and the edges, the lines, which imply interactions. Looking at this, we cannot understand. If we cannot understand how the pathway is actually regulated, if, however, the proteins have structures and we know that they interact, we can predict how they interact, as, for example, we have done here. And in this way, we can do this for all proteins that have structures and are known to interact. And we have done this here. Next, what we can do is to take all proteins and try to predict if they interact, even, we, even if we do not know that they interact. For example, there are no edges connected them. And we have done this as well. And when we did this, we could see the IAP, the inhibitor of apoptosis, positive feedback loop, which was not available before. As to the IL-1 signaling pathway, we have assembled the pathway from related, from related pathways and the literature. 
There are approximately 80 interactions between proteins with known structures. Only 16 or 20 percent have structures of protein-protein complexes, and the structures of the complexes provide interface residues with possible role in diseases, which can be seen by mapping the SNPs and mutational data. SNP, the nucleotide polymorphism, single nucleotide polymorphism. So here we have the IL-1 signaling pathway and that we have constructed with the structural data. Proteins which do not have structures in the PDB are in white. The rest which are colored have structures. The arrows which are shown in bold imply that there are the structures of the complexes in the PDB. Those which are in thin lines, those which are connected in thin lines, imply that we predict the structures. If we, you see dashed line, it implies that we have only one, the structure of only one side of the interface. Here is a, one example of a model that we have constructed, and I'm going to show you only this particular example of this particular uh, of these particular three proteins. So here is the complex that we predicted for the MECK4 and MECK3. MECK4 is in brown or gold, MECK3 is in blue. Residues which you see in balls are in the interface. If they are in brown, they belong to the MECK to the MECK protein. If they are in blue, they belong to the MECK3 protein. Residues which are in yellow are the hotspots residues belonging to MECK4. And those which are in cyan are hotspot residues. Again, hotspots contribute uh, significantly to the stability of the complex. Are belong, are, are hotspot residues belonging to MECK3. The red residues, one of these that we can see is the asparagine 234 in the top. The mutation of asparagine 234 to isoleucine has been related to ovarian, uh, uh, to ovarian serous carcinoma. As we can see, this particular residue sits right in the interface, as does serine 251. And the mutation of two, serine 251 to asparagine again has been associated with metastatic melanoma. Another example here, make K4 with June K2, the same coloring scheme. Here again, we can see the serine 251, whose mutation to asparagine is related to metastatic melanoma sitting right in the, in the interface. And the last example here, make K4 with June K3. Here we see the arginine 154, whose mutation to trip has been to tryptophan, is has been related to colorectal adenocarcinoma, which is the most common type of colon cancer, and the GLAN1, the glutamine 142 mutation to leucine, also in the interface, has been associated with lung cancer. I'm sorry, to, with lung squamous cell carcinoma. So next, what we have done is to try and understand the mechanism of the mutations. In order to do this, we evaluated the stability of the complex in the case of the wild type and the mutations. Most of the time, the mutations destabilize the complex. What it means is that the protein does not need the binding of its partner in order to turn it on. The mutation already can already do this, which then turns the protein on constitutively. For the repressor proteins, it acts in the opposite way, stabilizing the interaction with a similar outcome. Here, we look at the toll-like receptor pathway in inflammation, which we also have been interested in, and by now have been have been have worked part of it. We have been we have worked out. Here are 
some of the interactions related to the pathway, the modeled interactions of my D88. What we can see is, here is, in the center, that the MyD88 has two domains, the death domain on the top and the tear domain in the bottom. The, we have the crystal structures of these, and they are connected by some linker. Here you see it as dashed line because there is no structure for the linker. It's highly flexible. Looking at the death domain and predicting its interactions, what we can see is that the death domain interacts with IRA4 through the cyan uh, interface, the cyan box, leading to the NF kappa B inflammatory pathway. However, that same binding site can overlap with the interaction of MyD88 with the Fed protein. And interaction of the MyD88 with the Fed leads to the apoptosis pathway. Two opposing pathways with opposing functions, with rem which remarkably or interestingly share the same interface. This suggests that MyD88 signals either through the IROC4 pathway, that's to say either inflammation or apoptosis. Similarly, we can see on the top, MyD88 with TRAF6, the interaction. At the same site, we have MyD88 with TRAF3. Again, TRAF3 and TRAF6, these are two opposing, leading, lead to opposing, func opposing pathways with opposing functions. And at the bottom, the same principle, the tier domain of the MyD88, which interacts with the tier domain of the toll-like receptor, TLA4 in this case, that we have looked at, and the, that interaction, MyD88 and MAL, interact with the tear domain of the toll-like receptor. However, it, this interaction competes with the interaction of trump -TRIF. Here we can see such competing interactions, in this case, MyD88, interacting with IROC4 and FED, and we can see they cannot take place at the same time because we will have steric hindrance, steric clash. Here, another example, in this case for the ERC, the kinase. So what we can see is that the ERC can interact with MEK1 and PLA2 at the same time. However, MEK1 can, at the bottom cannot interact with MP1 and MEK2 at the same time because they use a shared binding site on MEK1. Similarly, though not exactly the same situation we have here, where we see that the ERC cannot interact with PTP and RISC2 at the same time, not because they share an interface, but because there is a steric clash between these two proteins if they were to interact at the same time with ERC. Here is the RAS pathway map, which is again another, another pathway that we are now extremely interested in and are actively working on. There are no, the, the, the pathway is, is largely not understood. And we can, what we have is proteins. We have the structures of some of the proteins, and we can see the pathway diagrams, again, with links. However, we do not understand what happens. There are different isoforms. RAS has different isoforms, which prefer to signal through different pathways. Can we understand this from here? Or when there are different oncogenic mutations, again, they prefer to signal through different pathways. Without detailed structural data, we cannot understand. And here we can see this by looking at some statistics. Here, the RAS isoform mutations in human cancer. So RAS has three major isoforms, KRAS, NRAS, and HRAS. And the KRAS has two, sub, has two uh, isoforms, KRAS for A and KRAS for B. KRAS is particularly oncogenic. Looking at the numbers, we can see that KRAS has a 95% incidence in pancreatic cancer, 45% incidence in colorectal cancer, 35% in lung adenocarcinoma. 
we have no idea, we do not understand why KRAS is so prevalent in these particular cancers as compared to the NRAS, which is more common in AML or melanoma, and HRAS, which is uh, more common, not very common, but still more common in bladder cancer. We do not understand these numbers. So the KRAS alleles have distinct biology and we do not understand why. KRAS G12V and G12C have worse clinical outcome than G12D. We have no idea why. So here we have the G12, glycine 12, which can be mutated to either valine or cysteine, and these have the worst clinical outcome as compared to the mutation of the same glycine 12 to aspartic acid. KRAS G12D has elevated PI3K and MAP signaling as compared to the others. We have no idea why. KRAS G12C and G12 V has elevated RAL GDS signaling and other effectors. All of these effectors appeared in the RAS diagram that I have shown you before, and we again do not understand why from looking at that diagram. And the KRAS G13, the response to this particular drug. However, G12 mutants do not. So it looks like mutations of the same residue leads to altered signaling through those pathways that we have seen before, but the MAP could not explain this. So the questions that we ask is, can such questions be tackled by detailed structural data? We believe so. Here are the KRAS mutations in three diseases, in colorectal, lung, and pancreas. And again, we can see, if you look at the line of, the col of, for example, the colorectal cancer, you see the large variability in the incidence for G12C versus G12D versus G12V versus G13D. We don't understand these numbers. And similarly, we do not understand them. Look at the lung cancer. We have 22,000 uh, I mean, cases for the G12C versus 1,190 for the G13D. We do not understand why. So mechanistic questions on the molecular level in KRAS biology that we have been asking include, does RAS disordered hypervariable region, or HVR for short, at the C terminal has a role beyond membrane anchoring? Does RAS dimerize, and if so, which is what we believe, why, and in particular, how? What are RAS redundant pathways? What are the mechanisms of RAS oncogenic mutations and calmodulin? Where does it bind and how does it inhibit RAS acti RAS activation and more? We are interested in all of these questions and we are addressing all, but in my talk today, I'm going to relate only to the first. So it's been well established that the frenesylated HVR anchors RAS in the membrane. However, unexpectedly, we found that the HVR of KRAS4B, which has been thought to minimally impact the catalytic domain, directly interacts with high affinity with the active site of GDP bound, but not GTP bound, KRAS4B. So the question is, does HVR also have an overlooked regulatory role, which is what it seemed to us? Our collaborator, Nadia Tarasova, in the, in also in the Cancer and Inflammation Program in the, at the NCI in Frederick, has carried out a number of biophysical experiments. Among these is the microscale thermophoresis, which shows that the HVR peptide interacts better with the GTP than with the GTP bound KROS for B. But still, we would like to understand where and how does the KRAS 4B HVR preferentially bind, because if we have the structure, then we may be able to better understand the reason and the mechanism. Our collaborator in Chicago, Vadim Gaponenko has carried out NMR chemical shift perturbation experiments for the GDP bound 
Kairos for B and the GTP bound Kairos for B. As one can see, we have an ensemble of states, which is not surprising. The HVR at the C terminal is highly flexible, it's highly positively charged, so it's expected. Still, the question stands where and how does the Kairos HVR preferentially bind? We then modeled the ensemble of states, simulated them following the HVR data, and what we have observed is, and you can see this in the circled region, that the, that the HVR can adopt a beta strand conformation, which is, which is selected by the beta sheet of the RAS protein at the active site. So the HVR can, the beta strand can then extend the beta strand in the in the effector one binding region, this is where the some most of the some of the effectors bind. This is for the GDP bound KRAS for B. And this is as one can see at the bottom, in agreement with the NMR data and with Nadia's biophysical experiment. On the other hand, for the GTP bound KRAS for B, we see only loose interaction of the of the uh, HVR, we see this at the bottom, this blue uh, segment, again in agreement with NMR data and with Nadia Tarasova's experiments. So our results suggest that the HVR roles extend beyond membrane anchoring to include prevention of premature signaling of KRAS for BGDP, a function that was overlooked earlier. In, in, in earlier KRAS4B signaling models, and the auto inhibition sets a threshold signaling control, and the HVR binding interferes with RAS rough interaction, slows down nucleotide exchange, and inhibits RAS signaling in tumor cells. And finally, and Importantly, significantly, the HVR's autoinhibition identifies a new RAS druggable surface. So why are we interested in so why are we interested in structural pathways? Structural pathways predict new interactions not observed in classical pathways in particular in scaffolding protein. They, I, they allow identification of redundant pathways in drug-resistant mutants. They may discover positive feedback, altering core processes as we did in the case of inhibitors of apoptosis or the IAP protein. They provide interaction details. They allow identification of oncogenic mutations, as I have shown you, for the IL-1 pathway, they help drug discovery, they allow assembly multi-subunit signaling complexes, as I've shown you, for example, for the MID-88, the KSR, and interactions that cannot coexist, just like I've shown you for the ERK, MP1, MEC2, and the ERK, PTP, and RSK. And simulations provide insight into the mechanism and they allow verification. So why is insight into the mechanism of single proteins important? They, the mech, this helps in relating oncogenic mutations to their constitutive concept, to their, I'm sorry, to their constitutive consequences, whether activation or binding. The mechanism helping understand, or sim the simulations, I should say, help in understanding the mechanism of drug resistant mutants, and they help in drug discovery by testing the stability of their interactions. And the care and the proteins that we are currently studying relate to growth, migration, angiogenesis, invasion, and metastasis of cancer cell, including the RAS. Where, where we are addressing activation and binding kinases, particularly we are interested in the EGFR and the RAF protein and the PI3K, and the efferin receptor and tyrosine kinases and their efferin li ligands and the BCL2 apoptosis and more. Here, just to give a, uh, a short 
overview, a brief, I should say, overview of the mechanisms of oncogenic mutations, how they work, and here uh, with the example taken from, this, from the kinases. So the oncogenic mutations can bypass autoinhibition through three mechanisms. On the left-hand side, we see, on the top left-hand side, we see a free energy description with the, um, of the, of the, of the proteins of in, the, in the active and inactive states, where we can see that on the right hand, on, I'm sorry, on the left hand side, what we can see, I'm sorry, I have to put my glasses on to see. On the left hand side, we see that we have the active state on the right. If you look at the red curve, we see that it has a lower minima as compared to the left hand side. That means that, I'm sorry, in the act, the native state is in the in green, whereas the mutant state is in the red. So, in the left hand side, we see that under normal circumstances, physiological circumstances, we see that the left hand side in, of the green has a lower minima than the right hand side, which implies that the inactive state is more stable. On the other hand, when we have a mutation. What happens is that the active state on the right, and this is in red, lowers the minima. So now the conformation shifts to the right-hand side. And this we can see in the figure just under it, where we can see that there we have this particular mutation of the T this particular mutation there, which is marked, which stabilizes the hydrophobic uh, regulatory spine of the active state. In the middle, we can see mutations in the middle of the free energy landscape on the, you know, on the top left-hand side. We can see that mutations can also destabilize the inactive state, which would have the same outcome. The active state would have a lower minima than the inactive state. And we see the situation on the right hand side at the bottom where the mutation disrupts the hydrophobic core of the inactive state. And on the right hand side at the top, we can see that the mutation, that mutations can work through both mechanisms. Destabilize the inactive state and stabilize the active state. And this we can see at the bottom of the right-hand side panel, where the mutations both stabilize the alpha helix in without the li without ligand-induced receptor dimerization. Here are some uh, overview of the mechanisms of allosteric mutations. I'm not going to go into it. We don't have time. And finally, the the major bottom line of the talk that computational structural biology can help experiment by providing more complete information and leads. A complete map of key cellular pathways with structural data, including multimolecular associations of scaffolding proteins, is critical to fully understand cancer cell biology with the abnormality originating from deregulation of signaling pathways. And I shall close by thanking my colleagues at the NCI here in Bamjeng. Buyong Ma and Chang Jang Tsai, and our great collaborators at Koch University, Oslem Keskin and Attila Borsoi, and our great students, Nurjan, Gozde, Selim, Eje, Bilur, Gurai, Emine, and Serena, in Tel Aviv University, Haim Wolfson, and our great students, Max, Nurit, Alex, Oranit, Dina, Efrat, in Hungary, my great collaborator, Peter Shermley, and as to the RAS, the collaboration with uh, Carla Matos from Northeastern University, she's a crystallographer, and with Nadia Tarasova at the NCR and Vadim Gaponenko, University of Illinois, I described this work, and the head and neck squamous cell carcinoma people where we collaborate on the TLR, uh, TLR, IL-1, and TRAF, Carter Van Wes, and Zong Chen, 
and the inflammation and cancer pathways with the CIP, the Cancer and Inflammation Program. And with that, I shall thank you very much. And I shall only show a beautiful image which was drawn by Peter Sermeli's uh, friend, who is an artist, and it appeared on the cover, showing how drugs can work in the network. And these are allosteric drugs. So the drug here targets the protein at the bottom, the blue one. The, the diseased, in, in quote, protein is the one at the top in pink. But through the network and through the interactions, the, the allosteric effect uh, should go. Even though this figure is not exactly right, it's an artist rendering. In reality, the proteins should have interacted, physical interactions here, they don't, but still it conveys the spirit. So thank you very much. If there, I don't know, is there are any, uh, if, uh, any questions? Since there are no questions, may I shall just thank the audience for listening, and uh, I guess we can get off the air. <laughs>